Standing waves. So now we're talking about standing waves in a room, and we discussed basically a resonant frequency, that a frequency can fit inside this room specifically because of the dimensions of the room, and some frequencies get amplified and some get diminished. Where there's constructive interference, where the reflection constructively adds to the wave that's already there, it's called a node. There you go. It's a good picture of it. And an antinode is where they destructively interact. And this is actually looks like an old mattress, but it's actually a picture of a real room that shows you what the sound quality is like at certain positions. If you're standing in a room listening to music, if you walk into the corner of the room, it's always going to sound more bassy. Take a look at this picture. That's where frequencies build up. Certain parts of the room frequencies are diminished. So naturally in a recording studio, in a control room, the corners of the room they want to dampen. They want to absorb sound because it builds up in the corners. Sometimes they use trapping, tube traps, stuff like that to sort of try to take away some of that excess buildup of frequencies. So the acoustic treatment of a room, of an auditorium, a movie theater, a stadium, any of these places <clears throat> that have good acoustics, it's because the nodes and antinodes aren't so exaggerated because of the size and shape and space that you're listening in. Circles and, and spheres and those kinds of shapes all have specific kinds of reflective patterns of sound, and so regular shapes, squares, rectangles, um, those things are difficult because they have a specific predictable pattern as to how they work. Whereas in a control room where you don't want this kind of buildup, you want odd angles, you want walls that are leaning a little here and a little odd shape so corners aren't exactly square, and the, the ceilings always go a little like this and like that, and they, so it's not really reflecting parallel walls. You want no parallel walls because then the reflections don't tend to build up, they tend to bounce around, but never really reinforce each other. And as we talked before about diffusion, they use diffusers in the back of control rooms quite often, which are multi-leveled kind of fixtures that are placed on the wall. When sound hits it, some sound reflects from here, some sound reflects from there, there's angles, some goes this way, some goes that way, and it just sort of confuses the sonic quality of the sound so that when it does reflect back, it doesn't interfere or reflect back or cause any sort of resonant frequencies. The resonant frequencies is when it reinforces itself because it's a parallel surface that's just bouncing back and forth. Now, in a normal room, there's three basic modes that we talk about. One is called the axial mode, which is the reflection from wall to wall, floor to ceiling, those parallel walls. Tangential involves two dimensions. Tangential would be a reflection off that wall, reflecting into that wall, reflecting into that wall, and around the room like that. So there's a potential resonant frequency that's around the walls, or floor to ceiling, back and forth, because you hit a 45 degree angle to the floor, it's going to reflect on that wall, 45, 45, four, and, uh, and around. So you get these kind of tangential modes. And then you have an oblique mode, which is even more complex, where it goes from floor to wall to ceiling and sort of on this angle in this rectangular space. This is an example of axial modes and how the sound can build up. And there's actually uh, a formula for room modes. You put in the dimensions of the room, and it spits out what frequencies are more likely to be reinforced in that room. So you'll find that, a couple examples here, that in cubicle rooms, it's the absolute worst. And small rooms is really, really bad. Rectangular rooms, really, really bad. Now, the worst of all worlds, with, which I didn't include here on a card, is listening on headphones. Everyone loves to listen on headphones, but they love to listen on headphones because it sounds so good. Because the room doesn't interact with you at all. It's just from the speaker to your ear. And it's perfectly isolated. One ear, the left ear, and the right ear are perfectly separated. So this is perfect isolation. So everything sounds so much better than the way it would normally on a set of speakers. So it's extremely hard to mix on headphones. Let's say you've got your home studio and you're trying to just spruce it up a little so it sounds a little better, right? Here's a couple tips that I can give you. Sound isolation is one of the most difficult things to do because sound has energy 
and that energy is very powerful. It can get through walls real easily. Any time that air can travel, sound can travel. So through the air ducts, under the doors, around the windows, sound escapes and comes in both directions. So any time that air can come and go, sound can travel in and out. Problem is, you need fresh air to breathe if you're going to be in that room. So however you get it in there, sound can also escape out that direction. So it's very difficult to really, really isolate. But one of the core principles is that mass can stop the energy from leaving. If it's a massive wall of concrete, it's going to stop sound a whole lot better than if it's, you know, drywall or a curtain. Makes sense. So the sound is energy hitting this object, and obviously if it's a massive object, it's going to stop the energy flow. Replacing your doors, the hollow core doors in, in most apartments, these thin light doors that just act for privacy, they don't act for sound isolation at all. You could replace those and put in heavier doors and it really makes a big difference. Address the air spaces around doors. You can put kind of weather sealing you can put around your doors. That really helps sound to stay in and not just escape. If you really want to get you know, excited about it, you can put extra layer of drywall on your walls and make it more massive. They, they make this stuff called resilient channel, which is really interesting and it's really low cost. And let's say you're trying to soundproof a garage for your band to rehearse in or whatever. The resilient channel is basically you take a wall and you put this channel on there and the channel is made out of metal and it's got this kind of a, a spring-like thing to it. And then you can put another layer of drywall and screw it into this so it's isolated from the first wall. So when sound hits this wall, it moves this big heavy piece of drywall just a little bit and absorbs the energy and it never gets through to this other wall, it never can get out. It's kind of like you want to absorb the energy somehow. The energy is not going to go away. It has to be absorbed. How does it get absorbed? It gets absorbed by moving some sort of an object. And the heavier the object, the less it has to move to absorb more energy. This channel is really low cost and it really works really well. So a lot of people that I know always asking me, how do I soundproof my garage? I want to rehearse in my garage. And this is the best way to do it. And it, it'll take a weekend and it won't cost much and it'll work really well. Of course, after you put the drywall on there, then you want to maybe hang a curtain in front of it because you don't want sound reflection off of it too much either. So um, the best way to do that is take, you know, a standoff like a piece of wood, like a two by four, and then put a curtain or a wall hanging or a piece of carpet just hanging in front. And so the sound hits this and it moves it back and forth a little bit, gets through, moves this, and pretty soon it's like deteriorated and it doesn't reflect back much at all. Easy, low-cost ways of helping to soundproof a space. But be aware, very few things can really fully soundproof a room, unless you spend lots and lots of money.